Our final speaker before we move into Q&A will be Jesse Wente, Director of Film Programs at Toronto International Film Festival, whose talk is titled, First Flicker. Uh, bonjour, Annie. It's um, wonderful to be here. Uh, very intimidating, I have to be honest, to be here. Uh, not only did I get to meet uh, Adrian, who we've had a long-term social media relationship for the first time, but uh, Dr. Cole is an unexpected and great honor uh, to be here for that ceremony. Um, so, I'm not a professor, so I'll try to live up to my colleagues here. Um, and I'm also, I should admit, Canadian. <laughs> or I'll correct that, I'm Anishinaabe, but I come from Canada. Uh, and so I'm going to talk, you'll get some Canadian history here, sorry, <laughs> mixed in with some American history, and sadly it appears I brought the weather. So again, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I talk about movies because that's really what I know about, and we're going to talk a little bit, you know, I've I spent much of my early career um, sort of deconstructing Hollywood's portrayal of indigenous people. I've moved a little bit beyond that to look at, um, as Adrienne pointed out, the disparity between depictions in popular culture and the reality that indigenous face when it comes to governmental policy and um, oversight. So um, just to set the quick context, movies were invented roughly at exactly the same time in, eight, in the 1890s in two different places in Lyon, France, by the Lumiere brothers, uh, who invented the, um, their cinematograph actually projected on a screen. Uh, so they, they invented movies as we know them. And then Thomas Edison and his, um, his engineer, William K. Dixon, invented their version of cinema in upstate New York in the, late, uh, in the early 1890s. So, um, You'll know some of these movies. The, Lyon, uh, the Lumiere Brothers, the most famous movie is um, Workers Exit a Factory. You may have seen this. It's literally, that is it. <laughs> That's the plot. Um, I think key though, I always like to mention is, is that, you know, that film was presented really as what they would call actuality or, or documentary or reality. Um, they shot it three times that day. So they did three takes. And then a month later, they went back and shot it again. So the Lumiere brothers not only invented cinema, they invented the remake. <laughs> but I think it's important, you know, as Orson Welles famously said, uh, film is 24 lives per second. So I think it's key to understand, even when they were presenting documentary images, they were not actually documentary. They had them do it again and again to make sure they got it right. Um, Edison decided to, in 1894, the Buffalo Bill uh, Cody Wild West show was in town at the time, and he was doing camera tests with William K. Dixon uh, in September of 1894, uh, and they made two films that day. These are the first films ever made in America. Uh, they're now protected by the uh, Library of Congress here. Um, so let's take a look at the first one. This is called The Buffalo Dance. These are Sioux performers from the Wild West show doing the dance. And the second film here is called um, The Ghost Dance. These would have been watched on an individual viewer. You would have paid your penny and watched it. You can actually see an advertisement for the Buffalo Bill show in the right-hand corner there. So, a couple of important things to note about these, these films. These are um, trained performers dancing. So they were in a show. And the Buffalo Bill show at the time was a massive event. These were huge events. Imagine Cirque du Soleil, but with cowboys and Indians and fairly blatant racism. Same sort of idea. Um, now, by this time in American history, of course, the Old West was essentially over. Uh, after decades of conflict, uh, the West was already at this time being mythologized in literature and Wild West shows like the Buffalo Bill show here and the one the performers were part of in political speeches. 
uh, essentially all over the place. And at the same time this was happening, indigenous cultures were being systematically attacked by the governments of both Canada and the US. Both countries at the time were engaged in an era of policy that focused on relocation and assimilation of First Nations. So in 1876 in Canada, they passed something called the Indian Act. This had two key elements at the time. It established the still active reservation system in Canada, and it created status Indians, which it meant that the government was given the right and ability to decide who was First Nations and who was not. Um, by the way, this act still exists as law in uh, Canada. In 1880, the act was amended to include the potlatch ban, which outlawed the potlatch and pretty much all other ceremonies. The potlatch was a ceremony uh, uh, native to the West Coast tribes of Canada. It outlawed the sun dance, all of our traditional practices. The US government followed suit in 1884 when it banned all pagan ceremonies. And I use quote because when they say pagan, they were really meaning indigenous and um, African-American ceremonies at the time. Under each law, people were arrested, charged, and sent to jail. Uh, in Canada, there's cases of entire communities being sent to jail for as much as six months for performing our dances, our stories, telling our stories, essentially, because the dances were our stories, to each other. Um, the potlatch ban in Canada was not lifted until 1951, so it was in act for 70 years. So you had entire generations of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in Canada who never would have heard their stories, would have lived and died having not heard. In the United States, you guys were a little behind us. You didn't get, uh, there wasn't until the Religious Freedom Act in 1978 that the ban on these rituals and dances were, uh, was lifted. Now, it's important to remember, we saw the image of the ghost dance. It was the ghost dance that actually led to the massacre at Wounded Knee, where 150 women and children were slaughtered by the American army for performing the ghost dance. So um, about a decade later after that, the American government passed the Dawes Act, which essentially privatized huge swaths of First Nations land in the US. Uh, Adrian had that incredible graphic that shows that in action, that GIF. This was, this was an advertisement for uh, treaty lands for sale. Uh, this shrank total tribal lands by more than 80% in just a matter of a decade or so. And the last major piece of these policies in both countries um, were the schools. So residential schools had been around in Canada in, by the 18, in the 1840s, they started, in Ontario, where I'm from. Uh, but in 1894, so the same year that Edison shot those films, the Indian Act was amended to make attendance at day schools or industrial schools mandatory in Canada. You had to send your children to residential school, where they then barred you from using your language, having your customs, and attempted to assimilate you. Assimilate you. Many of my family went to residential school in Spanish Ontario. In 1879, America opened up its most famous residential school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, a school that would produce sports stars as well as future movie stars like uh, Lillian St. Cyr, Princess Red Wing, who would go on to be a huge star in the silent movies. Now, by this point, um, in the movies, Indians are the hottest thing. In the silent era, they made hundreds and hundreds of westerns. Most of these, sadly, are lost due to the fact that they were made on nitrate stock, which um, tends to explode. Yeah, and did many times. So, um, so most uh, the dominant genre of silent film was, in fact, uh, Western. But we're really pre-Hollywood, pre-studios, per se. Uh, but you've got lots of arcades using the single-slot mach use machines, and gradually old vaudeville houses were converted into theaters that turned into cinemas. And demand is great. So they are churning out what they called one-reel Westerns, which are roughly about 12 minutes, um, sometimes one or two a week at this point. And the in fact, the first recorded term of the use Western was in 1912 in World Picture, Motion Picture World magazine. And depictions at the time were actually quite varied. There was some relatively progressive portrayals to the more typical savage character that would become increasingly popular in the 1920s and later in the 1930s with the advent of sound. Um, but we're gonna pause here for the year in 1914. So the image here we're looking at is a movie actually made in Canada in, among the Kwakalak people on the west coast of BC in Canada. This is a film called In the Land of the Headhunters, which was shot, um, made by uh, Edward Curtis, who is the famed ethnographic photographer. Uh, I won't go much into him, other than to say that um, he made the film with the, with the tribe. They performed many um, dances, all of which, by the way, were illegal 
at the time, for them to perform outside of the movie set. Just like the dancers for Edison, that was illegal. People had been slaughtered for performing their dances. It was only for the gays of non-indigenous people that those were allowed. So In the Land of the Hunters was filmed in 1914. Um, the community still actually uses this because there's many dances and ceremonies that have been lost that this film actually captures. Uh, although there are anachronisms, they danced the wrong way around the fire. No one is quite sure why, why they did that. Um, and there's, of course, an issue that I think we'll, we'll touch on a lot here, which is you can see the depiction there. There's uh, Edward Curtis on set in the hat in the middle there. Um, all, so, for example, um, everyone here is depicted with long hair. They are all in wigs. Because by this time, the men um, had cut their hair long ago. But Edward Curtis wasn't interested in modernity or contemporary indigenous portrayals. They only wanted to portray the past. So everyone had to don a wig. And this is a major part of indigenous representation that has remained a constant since the Edison films. You have indigenous people depicted as an ancient culture. There are no com contemporary depictions at this time. And there really wouldn't be until indigenous people started making their own films in the 70s and 80s. We are, and in fact, if you go to this gallery, there's a great photo exhibition of uh, Horace uh, Pola's photography, which I think is a wonderful antidote to Curtis, uh, if you have a chance to come back and see it. Um, and this really helps in reinforce the colonial narrative of manifest destiny, which inherent to it requires the erasure of indigenous people on this land, but also the submission of African Americans. Can't, can't have a manifest destiny without both of those things. Now, a decade after this, we would get another key silent, um, Robert Flaherty's Nanook of the North. This is often described as the first documentary ever made. It's not at all a documentary. Uh, Flaherty's film blends fact and fiction, uh, so it cast the role of the family. They were not a family, but they're presented as such. Uh, Nanook hunts for seal by using a spear. By this time, the Inuk had long been using guns to hunt uh, for this. Uh, there's a fantastic scene where they introduce a phonograph record player for the first time. Of course, the Inuk had had that technology for 20 years by the time this movie um, came in. So the film stands, you know, it's standing as a documentary, belies its fabrication, and once again we see the representation loop of indigenous performance treated as indigenous existence. So us acting like us is actually treated as us. And, we, and in, the, in the absence of truth, um, lies can become the truth. So at this point, uh, after this, once sound came in, Westerns made a huge comeback with towering directors such as John Ford and Howard Hawks resurrecting the genre from the B picture warehouse, dusting it off and reinvigorating it with a sense of nationalism and jingoism that appealed in wartime and immediately after. So that we had Stagecoach, the prototypical Western of this era, which was released in 1939, a marvel of landscape photography, astonishing stunt work for the, all the uncredited indigenous stunt performers. And of course, reductive, brutal racism. Uh, the Indians portrayed as bloodthirsty savages, physically impeding the progress of civilization, embodied by its hero, played by John Wayne, in the role that would make him a star. Now, Wayne and Ford would make many films together over the years, with Wayne as Ford's on-screen cipher. Um, Ford's view of America and its history changed over the years, certainly more than Wayne's uh, ever did. Um, largely, I think, a result of Ford having gone to war and Wayne having decided to stay back in Hollywood to make pictures. Their most famous and now most well-regarded picture together was 1956, The Searchers, a violent, beautifully made movie that directly confronts the issues of race in America while still making sure that Wayne wins in the end. He's virtually clad in the American flag through much of the film, red, white, and blue all the time, despite being a virulent racist for most of the picture. Um, I, you know, many defend this movie as being Ford's apology, um, I think it's his apology is sort of undone by the fact that John Wayne just could not ever be viewed as the villain by the audiences. So they cheered when he did vile things. Now, just to show that this cycle of representation and reality persists, when The Searchers was released in 1956, the American government had introduced its relocation grants, a program established in 1950 and expanded six years later. They gave money for indigenous people to move away from their communities to cities like Los Angeles. And this was particularly targeted at the Navajo Nation, which had actually adopted Ford uh, 
some years earlier for his work in the, um, in the community. So by now I'm sure the cycle is clear. You make movies about us for widespread consumption by non-natives while passing oppressive policy off screen to keep us away. There's another modern example, Dances with Wolves. Uh, this occurred three years after this in Canada. Uh, I know where attention's on Standing Rock now, but this was actually an armed standoff in, outside of Montreal in the Ganawage community. Uh, the Canadians sent their army to face off against the, um, the warriors. We still see this with The Revenant, a film which won multiple Oscars and is, takes place just south of where the Dakota Access Pipeline is going in. Um, so we see what happens. In the absence of true indigenous stories told by indigenous people with accurate, true information, false narratives become real. And I have to say, this is still very much where we are. We have seen a rise in indigenous cinema and media, that's for sure. But things like Chief Wahoo, the Washington Redskins, they still exist. Movies like The Roan Ranger and The Revenant are still being made and winning Oscars. And indigenous people are still suffering. Our life expectancy is almost 20% shorter than the average American or Canadian. We're jailed at a rate multiple times that of others. Our children, so this is particularly to Canada, are still far more likely to be involved with child welfare or removed from our homes. Uh, I mean, we have a suicide crisis in Canada uh, in our north in 2015, the largest cause of suicide, uh, this is in Nunavut, was, the largest cause of death was suicide in Nunavut. It beat cancer. Uh, in fact, just this yesterday, a chief was in Ottawa trying to get help for suicide prevention and her cousin committed suicide on, while she was meeting with government officials. By placing us in the past, by presenting us as savages and princesses or noble warriors doomed to fail, because the noble part comes with the fact that we are going to fail inevitably, that's what Manifest Destiny says, an environment has been created, a culture has been created that accepts all of these inequalities. We've created a culture trained to ignore indigenous voices, to ignore our rights, to ignore us. And if you want more proof, you just have to look at Standing Rock, as Adrian so eloquently put. And I'll just end, because I think we'll get to this in the, um, the discussion, you know, the, what, the thing colonial states fear more than anything else is being colonized. And that's because while they will deny their colonization all the time, they have institutional memory of the violence and oppression it took for them to gain the privilege that they now hold. And they're deathly afraid that others will, will come and take it. And so they, so they turn the policies that we just saw, policies of assimilation, relocation, and oppression, outward. I'll finish in just two seconds. <laughs> they attack ceremony. It was just a couple weeks ago in, in Quebec where a white nationalist came into a mosque and killed six people. Um, your president hasn't acknowledged this attack yet because I don't think it fits his narrative. Um, but it did happen. And so, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I think that's it, but I think we'll get to more uh, afterwards. Miigwech. Okay, yeah, sure. After that last comment by Jesse Wente, I don't think I'll watch an alien invasion movie in quite the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> 